Hi, Mike. Hi. Are you ready to be proactive and sharpen the saw to synergize our win-win solution? Today's the day. Today's the day. Seven habits of highly effective people. There was just, there was a couple of things that I was interested in talking about today. Um, mm -hmm. One was your surprisingly compelling 24-hour death stream. Oh, did you like that? Yeah, I did like that very much. So you had a new video in the CGP Grey Doom and Gloom series that came out. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? Okay. That's, what, that's <laughs> how I think of it in my head. I feel like it was very optimistic, but okay. Was it though? <laughs> because uh, <laughs> even the idea of living forever i'm not sure if it was supposed to be in a way that i was completely comfortable with but you you going alongside this video was mm -hmm. a 24 hour live stream of an mm -hmm. accurate representation of how many people die on earth in a day and it was mm -hmm. fascinating it was like on in my house for like 45 minutes just in the background like i i started yeah. watching it and then i just kind of walked away from the tv and, the, and it was just playing and like i look back it's like five thousand. i was like oh no and i had to turn it off <laughs> it was it was too much mm -hmm. to come back and see the numbers yeah. just getting bigger and bigger the little pile of skulls getting bigger and bigger yeah it was good though it was a great idea it's one of those things that that actually ended up coming out of a technical limitation so i, I had this idea originally of like okay i like this idea of this 24 hours of death as a visual representation of, of what's occurring like how do you how do you convey the magnitude of this thing because if you just you just say a big number like it means nothing to people whereas i feel like oh if i put together a little video like this it has more of a chance of having an impact uh you know in exactly that way that that you say like you start watching it and then you come back later and it's like oh my right I, well while i was washing the dishes ten thousand people died right yeah. and so it's it has it has an impact it drove it home right that it was like yeah. i could just watch this mesmerizing animation where someone was getting their head cut off every 10 every second mm -hmm. and yeah. oh, they, they were bursting into flames uh i think is, is what was occurring there. oh my apologies <laughs> Let's get the cause of death correct, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I had this idea like, okay, I wanted to do this. And, uh, you know, we're like putting together like this 24 hour long file and uh, go to upload it to YouTube. And I get a great, great YouTube error message, which is surprise. Videos are not allowed to be longer than 12 hours. Hmm. It's like, it's like, huh. That's interesting because I know for a fact that there are videos on YouTube which are hundreds of hours long. Like there's, there's, there are definitely videos that are super long, uh, but it turns out that at some point in the past, YouTube made a decision that they had enough of this tomfoolery with long videos and they decided to reduce the, the absolute limit down to 12 hours. Which is also longer than any video on YouTube should be. 12 hours is too long. Like, why? I mean, I know you found a reason for it, right? I, I was going to say, I, I have a very good reason why I would like a video that's longer than 12 hours. Thank you. Right. But it shouldn't be. Because no one's watching that. Well, actually, I'm <laughs> interested to know what your retention graphs are like on those videos. Uh, well, we, we can get into that later. But so anyway, I was, I was super annoyed about this uh, because I was like, oh, God damn it. Like, I don't want to I don't want to break a thing up into two parts. Like, I'm, I know that I'm going to have to break it up into two parts. But then I feel like that it, it makes it not as as good when you're uploading it for the first time and so I, I was spinning this around in in my head and then like talking with some people uh a few people mentioned the suggestion of actually like hey can you get around this by live streaming the thing and i was like wait a minute yes there is there is no limit on how long a live stream can be so uh that's what i ended up doing was okay i can get around this technical limit by making it live and then as soon as I realized that, I thought, oh, it actually works better if it's live. It's way better. Because people can't skip ahead, right? Like, people can't just jump. And it's buzzy. Yeah. Right? There is this thing. that This is what I found so compelling about it. There was a thing on the internet that was showing me how many people were dying. Like, it's mm -hmm. morbid, but like a car crash television. Right, like you, you kind of, you know, it's there. You can't help but look, mm -hmm. right? And like I kept checking in every now and then just to see how big the pile <laughs> of skulls was. Get. Like it was, you know, and like, and I kind of had it in my mind to make sure to look before it ended, right? Like it, I kind of, I knew it started at around like eleven a.m. my time or something. So kind of, it was like ten thirty or whatever, and I just checked in and it was like, oh man. But like it, it kind of had that <laughs> effect of it of like there is this thing that's happening which is showing this. How can I not at least look at it? Mm -hmm. so i think they work really well it's a great idea 
Oh yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty pleased with the way that came out in the end. I think that ended up being like more, much more interesting than the video itself in a way. Uh, was just doing this this live stream, so I'm I'm pretty yeah. happy with the way it with the way it came out. Yeah, like I liked the video, but I was more interested in the in the the live stream part. Like that was more exciting to me. Yeah, the live stream part is definitely the more interesting part. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah, so it was. Uh, I'm still annoyed that I wasn't able to upload the whole thing as one continuous file. So I did have to end up uploading the like the final version you? as two pieces. But I thought you could set a live stream as a video. Like you can just have it available. You can, but it will only save the last four hours. Oh, that's silly. Yeah, so... Uh, which is also interesting when I realize, like, I know people do 24 hour long, like, charity fundraisers, and it's like, oh, okay, so there's just no record of that. There's only a record of the last four hours yeah. of that. Um, because, yes, that was originally my thought was I was like, ha ha ha, fooled you, YouTube. Like, I'll just save the live stream. And then, and it's like, no, it's not going to work. It only saves the last four hours. But yeah, so anyway, I think this is just an interesting case of a an annoying technical limitation that I still genuinely wish wasn't there but that nonetheless ended up turning into a thing that is more interesting than it would have otherwise been. So I feel like that it worked out in the end. Yeah, because if you publish the video, I would just skip to the end. Right, yeah, everybody would have, yeah. But speaking of the uh, audience retention graphs, th there's, a there's a very funny thing in those audience retention graphs because uh, there are little Easter eggs throughout the 12 hours. Oh. I think there's something like 20 little Easter eggs that occur. <laughs> and... <laughs> When I loaded up the audience retention graphs, you can see the spikes no right around way. the areas where all the Easter eggs are. How are people finding them? Well, I think what's happening is someone sees it and then they jump back a couple seconds to say, hey, what did I just see that thing that I thought I saw? Right, which then double counts the audience retention in that spot. And then people leave comments. I've just saw so the comments. are jumping yeah. to those locations. Um, but it is hilarious. On the audience retention graph... Uh, you can see spikes for exactly where every single one of the little Easter eggs are. So That's it's wonderful. pretty funny. Like, there's like, hey, well, why the one at 557 have a hat on? And why at 751 <laughs> did they have a briefcase? I like that this person really <laughs> needed to, like, they were upset, right? Like, why? Why? <laughs> the, the, the why questions are great. And it is funny because when the, when the live stream first went up, I did, I did enjoy all the comments where people were saying things like, what does it mean? <laughs> like, what does it mean? It's like, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you to speculate, <laughs> commenters. Like, that's, that's what I'm going to leave. You yep. can speculate away about what it that's means. That's on you to work out. It's very profound, but you've got to figure it out yourself. I'm, I'm looking at these now. I've, I've got sucked into the comments. I want to see the Easter eggs. <laughs> Mike, we got a podcast to record. You no, can't be true. Easter egg hunting. Yeah, that's true. Unless we record for 24 hours, which I don't think is a good idea. But then we won't be able to post it on YouTube. Unless we live stream a 24 hour long cortex, which is not going to happen. Mike, do you know that you have become an animated character on the internet? Finally, right? <laughs> Finally? Yeah, they, I have waited for a cartoon for years. Finally, there is a cartoon of me. Since I was a kid, I've wanted to Mike the cartoon. Uh, and we have it now. There's a fantastic, I found this in the Cortex subreddit. Um, the person who created this video posted it. Um, it's HM Boutet is their YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the show notes. And they are putting together some fantastic Cortex animated videos, which I am enjoying immensely. Uh, and, and I wanted people to see them because I think it's really great. And, and I, there's one of the previous episodes. There's one of some classic moments from old episodes. Um, and I love seeing stuff like this. And it, it, they really make me laugh and I enjoy them immensely. <laughs> And you really like being a cartoon character? I love being a cartoon character. This person has an almost spooky ability to capture movements that I think I would make. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the, way, the way they animate my movements when talking to you is a lot of how I imagine they actually are. So I think it's brilliant. The one of these that I think is probably the best version is from, I think it was our very first episode where we're talking about the screen screens yep. uh, and home screen icons. And the... The way they animate you when you're when you're asking about what I think about your home screen, I think it's just it's just perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, people should go take a look at it. Like I, I think it, there's whether or not the way it is animated is the way it happens. Like it 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 adds something to the audio which makes it sound like that's the way that it happens. So it's uh, it's really well done. I'm always incredibly impressed by the way that people make these types of videos. Like, I watch some for some of my favorite shows. Mm -hmm. You know, th there are some fantastic um, animated videos for My Brother, My Brother and Me. Oh, yeah? And it, it, what I love about these types of videos is the way that people hear a thing. They hear mm -hmm. a thing, 
but the way they interpret it adds so much more to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I've, it's such a it's such an interesting skill that people have to be able to hear a sentence and pick out specific words and make a joke about those words in a way that was never originally intended. Like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's it's so interesting to see that, and also like the the kinetic nature of the videos is very interesting to me. The way that people make the movements and they adjust the audio to fit. It's I find it a very interesting skill mm-hmm. and I'm really pleased to see something for our show too because I love watching them for the shows that I enjoy. So it, it I don't know, it, it means a lot to me that people make this sort of stuff. So I want to thank that person and uh, encourage that people watch them because they're really, really fun. Yeah, no, it's 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 great stuff. It's it's a huge amount of work. I can't even imagine. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I can't imagine how much work it is, and it is always a, a, a funny experience, especially to see like a like a joke added to a thing that you yourself have said. Right, where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm watching a thing that's an animation of something that I have said, and then here is this extra layer that is put on top of it, which was not intended to be there. So it's it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So Gray, I've mentioned that I'm going to be traveling a bunch before the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I'm doing is PodCon, which is PodCon. the podcast version of VidCon, which may be, maybe just spark in many of our listeners' minds what this is. But it's like a celebration of the creation of podcasts, and there's going to be a lot of live shows and panels and things like that. I'm going to be there. Um, I now have a here's where you'll find Mike Hurley schedule. Oh, very exciting. Which I can put in the show notes. Because I'm doing a couple of things. I'm doing some panels and some roundtables and stuff like that. As you should be. You're a big man on podcast campus. <laughs> Pod campus, I think it would be called. Pod campus? Uh, the, yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to mention one thing that if people are going to be there, I'm going to be doing a signing at PodCon. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so you're going to be there. At a booth? Yep, at a booth. People are going to bring up things for you to sign? Maybe. I don't know what that would be. I guess, what do I sign? Mike Hurley merchandise? People's iPods? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I'm going to be there. You sign their beards? I don't know how that works. Yeah, I can sign beard oil. I don't know. Uh, but uh, December 10th, it's going to be at PodCon. I think you have you have to be an attendee to be there. And I am looking mm-hmm. forward to it. It does look like a really interesting event. Like, the whole schedule mm-hmm. is up now. But I'm going to be at a booth. Uh, in the signing area and everything and I wanted to just let people know about this I've never done anything like this before is is what I'm getting at here and I don't really know nervous Mike kind of I don't really know what to expect Um, so I want to make sure that if you're going to be at PodCon and you want to come and see me please do and I'm going to have I'm going to make this poster print for people that come <laughs> so if you come uh there will be a poster that i will sign and give to you <laughs> are you bribing the people mike it sounds it's like more you're bribing of an incentive the oh it's an incentive it's an okay. incentive it's there an will incentive. be a poster uh that i'm currently working on with a very talented artist and i may be able to share the artwork beforehand just because i think it's probably going to be amazing because this person's awesome i don't think you should i think you should keep the artwork secret for the people who are going to be showing up to see I you. I was thinking about like taking a picture of it in such a way that you couldn't use it for anything. Like my hand is there, right? But just so you know the amazingness that is going to be bestowed upon you, right? That you will get. Okay, I'm I, I'm going to suggest a different tack. Uh huh. You should take a picture that just shows them a corner of the poster, right? like, yeah, a, like a little, like a little tease, piece. Right? Little that's teaser. what you should do. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that. So you can understand how great it's going to be. But you don't get yeah. it. I'm trying to help you I like it. bribe the people to come, Mike. So this is this is my suggestion. Show a corner of the poster. I will do that. But I, I'm genuinely very excited for PodCon because this is a thing that I've wanted to exist for a while. And the schedule looks great. And I'm excited to go as an attendee and as somebody who's going to be involved in a few things. So, mm-hmm. But yeah, if you're going to be there, please come to my signing. You'll get a poster and it will make me very happy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> signings man like have you ever done a signing you have right something like that uh technically yes that that there was there was there was one case where i ended up doing a thing that was kind of a signing but it was it was a very special set of circumstances it was the yeah the random acts of intelligence show down in alabama mm-hmm. uh it was like just, i think that it was like a a very elite group of people who were there uh, oh, so wow. that, that is that is the one that is the one time uh, I, I've done it, but it also um, I, I have I have great sympathy for you, Mike, because 
in that situation, you didn't have the nerve of like, is anyone going to go to the signing? Because yeah. there were just five of us there. And it's like, these people are here to see us. So we know that if we go outside and do signings, we're not going to look like sad saddos who are just all on our own. But if you're at a big conference, it's a very different thing. And like, you don't know how much of your audience is going to be mm-hmm. at the, like the Cortex audience. Like, you know, it would be a long line if everybody was going to a mic signing but the question is yep. how many are going to podcon and so i, that, I can it. understand that's the yeah, point right like i, I don't can understand know. the cold <laughs> sweats in your hands right where, it, where it's like like mike mike could fill a stadium full of people if we got all the cortex people there but how many go to podcon right who knows exactly. like what it's going to look like so i i completely understand your your desire to bribe slash encourage people to go so I, I think that I think that's a good method. Tease the people with the excitement of, of what they get at a mic signing. And to any Cortex listeners, if you're going to PodCon, make sure to see Mike. Make sure to bring your beard oil. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by FreshBooks. Hey, freelancers, you know how important it is to make smart decisions for your business, right? Well, don't you also want to save time too? Well, by simplifying tasks like invoicing, expenses tracking, and getting paid online, FreshBooks reduces that time that their customers need to get their work done and also makes things easier for them every single day. Like for example, when you email a client an invoice of FreshBooks, you'll be able to see when they've received it and if they've seen it, then even if they've printed it, and every other time they then open it and do anything with it. This puts an end to the guessing games of whether somebody has looked at an invoice. They also have a new projects feature as well, which will allow you to share files and messages with your clients, contractors, and even employees, so you can see how quickly things happen when all of your conversations live in one place. And what better place than FreshBooks? FreshBooks have over 10 million customers, but they've managed to stay a pretty small company, landing them the title of Small Giant on Forbes' list of best small companies of this year. If you're listening to this and not yet using FreshBooks, now is the time to try it. They're offering an unrestricted 30-day free trial for listeners of this show. No credit card required. All you have to do is go to freshbooks.com slash Cortex and enter Cortex in the How Did You Hear About Us section so they know that you came to them from this show. Just before I recorded this, I was actually sending some invoices with FreshBooks. I really love this system. If you send invoices to anybody, I thoroughly recommend it to you, and I really, really, really insist that you give it a go. Freshbooks.com slash Cortex. Our thanks to Freshbooks for their support of this show and Relay FM. All right, Gray, I think that we're effectively warmed up at this point to discuss the book, The Cortex Book Club, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, I have had this on my list since the very beginning of our show. Right. This has been something that I have wanted to talk about. I've never read this book before, but I, like many people, am very aware of this as an idea, that there is a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm pretty sure I've had some of it mentioned to me during management training courses back in my old life, right? Like this is... I mean, you know, it's, what's it like 20 million, 15 million copies sold or something like that? I was looking it up this morning and yeah, it's it's 25 million copies sold. And it, it's something like one of the top 20 best-selling business books of all time. It, it's, it's, a, it's a mammoth giant in this field. This is the one. When it comes to these types of books, you know, like, like we've spoken about the E-Myth Revisited, right? Like we spoke about that. Mm-hmm. Like I think that all of these books are just trying to be the next seven habits like mm-hmm. this is like an entire empire there are many spin-off books there's like whole business set up around it like it is it, it is a big thing yeah there's like seven habits for the teenage chicken soup soul like there's you know it's yep. a whole many there's many spin-offs of this my favorite one the eighth habit i was like uh hang on a second how many are there is there an infinite amount of habits now well if people keep buying books yes there are an infinite number of habits yeah yeah there sure are what i want to do is i want to go through each of the habits and give a very brief outline of them and then mm-hmm. we can talk about if and how they apply to our working lives um, mm-hmm. either you know before or after but i wanted to kind of talk about the book in the abstract a little bit more so mm. you had read this before, right? This isn't your first time. This is my first time with the book, but it isn't yours, right? <laughs> yeah, no, this is not my first time at this rodeo. Uh, and, it's, and it is why uh, when we were mentioning that this was coming up in the last episode, I think, I think people could hear that there was some hesitation in my voice mm-hmm. to finally committing 
to doing this thing that you have been bugging me for years to do. Uh, yeah, so I I read this a long time ago, and I, I was I was I kept trying to remember, but I'm I'm pretty sure that I read this book along with a bunch of other books in this genre uh, before I ended up finding Getting Things Done, which was the book that really worked for me. You were looking for something, right? And none of these books gave you that. Yeah, like I, like I remember reading a book about uh, eating a frog. Like there's, there's a whole bunch of books that are, are like these well-known things. And, and this was one of these books. And yeah, I'm, I'm 95% sure that I read it before I read Getting Things Done a uh, long time ago, uh, back when I was a very different person. So yes, I, I have read this book. And uh, upon, upon rereading it, uh, much of it came rushing back mm. and and... So much of it was uh, surprising anew. Let's let's say that. So uh, yeah, reread the book, finished it, not thirty minutes before we started recording today. So uh, <laughs> I finished it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, just like just like homework in real life, mm -hmm. uh, where if a thing had to get done, I was going to do it in the class before the class when it was due. That is essentially what I did this morning. Is like, man, I timed it right down to a thirty-minute buffer of when I could finish this book, and I, I got it done just on time <laughs> let's just pull back the curtain a little bit more we're recording this episode like three days later than we were supposed to i wouldn't mm. have got the book done in time if we wouldn't have moved it so i was kind of pretty happy about that <laughs> yeah yeah that, it's, that is that is also the case i had some last minute travel plans that messed up our recording schedule but it was also a thing of i was like, happy I'm for it <laughs> never gonna finish this book in time like, otherwise i would have been pulling an all-nighter or something like there was just no way i had like seven hours to go Oh, it was. It's long. It's really long. It's really long. I, I, I want to say though, right? This book was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. I will say that. Like, it is frustrating at times, and I want to talk about some of those frustrations in a bit more detail. But I was mm -hmm. not infuriated listening to this book like I was the Emith Revisited. Which, by the way, if you've mm. never heard that episode of the show, it's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's a really good one to start with. If if uh, yeah, if you're like recommending people come to the show, like I think that's probably a great starting spot, right? Even if people haven't read the book, I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode. It was episode twenty one, January of last year. I thought it was longer than mm -hmm. that, but yeah, January of last year, episode twenty one, the Emith revisited. I recommend that one if you've not heard it, or I should say, if you're recommending someone for the show. But anyway, I actually found this book interesting at times and sometimes useful. Mm -hmm. In a way that, like, Emith, I took one thing from it. There was mm -hmm. one thing. And I think this book, it has more to it than that. I can actually, whilst reading it, can be like, okay, I know why this got as popular as it did. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a lot of problems with it. But on the whole, there is good information in this book. And it isn't, it isn't infuriating. Like, I wasn't mm -hmm. screaming at my phone like I was when I was listening to Emeth. Yeah, you you were really frustrated with I Emeth. hated that book. It was it, <laughs> it was everything I don't like about that type of thing that book had it. Right. But like, you know, I couldn't I, I would have to take breaks, right? Like if I was going to sit down and listen to this for 3 hours, I had to take a break like every 45 minutes cuz there's just only so much of this I can take, right? Like mm -hmm. I feel like it's just my brain is being filled up with mostly nonsense for a while, mm -hmm. right? And like and I have mm -hmm. to to like chill for a bit, but I've I found this one, I was like going like, hmm, I'm making more notes than I thought I would make, mostly for me. So uh, mm -hmm. this book, I can see why it is a big thing. I can see why it, why people really, really like what it has to say. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting to hear because part of my memory of, of the book and one of the reasons why I didn't feel like I wanted to read it again is because uh, my my review when people have asked me about it has has always been it's one good idea in a thousand pages. Right? This this was my mm. memory from having read the book the first time, uh, and so it was it was interesting to like read it again and see like do, does this hold up or or does this not hold up? And upon rereading this book, I feel like this book defeated my soul. Like I I feel really huh. beaten down from reading this book. So I feel like we're having a little bit of opposite reactions with Emith and this one, because in Emith I felt like like I kept was defending Emith. I'm like, yeah, it's crazy, but there's some good ideas in here, right? Whereas whereas with this one, like 
I, I think you could play the audiobook of of this as a method of torture, right? To just to make people divulge information by just looping it in their cell over and Interesting. over. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I will say, like, there is a huge chunk of this book that I think is pointless. Yeah, I mean, as with all these books, it could be dramatically shortened. Oh yeah. Oh but, but yeah. Mo- but more, but more than that, like, so even though this book totally defeated me, I also have the understanding of like, I I can see why this book was such a such a mammoth book. But my takeaway is, this book is almost like a like a Rorschach test, like people will, it's so vague in so many places that you can, I think people can just kind of read into it their own, their own situations. Um, but the, like the amount of actual actionable material struck me as like incredibly small. And, and what I felt like I was reading was a, like a productivity book Markov chain. Like, like this is just a, like an automatic AI generated endless string sentence of words in a productivity book that your brain is constantly struggling to pull meaning out of and, mm. and to find connections to. And it just never ends. Okay. It just goes on <laughs> forever. Yeah. And uh, when I say that this book defeated me, the, the thing that was, ha- was like, I started reading the book and I, I genuinely like read up to habit number two, which is sort of most of what I had remembered from from before. And then I, I realized like I'm reading this book, but the reading is in quotes where like I'm just pressing forward on the Kindle, like not not even skimming, but it's just like flip, 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 because my brain is, is like trying to get through this thing. Like, hey, let's just let's just turn some pages and then we'll focus on the words in a little bit. And it's like a pick up at another spot. It's like, oh, God, I can't stand this. So. I always make fun of you for reading the audiobook, but I had to buy the audiobook because I was aware that at a certain point, like I, I physically cannot read this book. There is, there is no way I can force my eyes to look at the words and have the, and have the meaning go into my head. It was just completely impossible. So I switched to the audiobook, which I never recommend people do for this kind of book. Nope. And then I felt like I was being brainwashed for six more hours <laughs> so I, it's like i i feel like i have come out of a, an experience somewhat traumatized and uh i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna give a, a no recommend to this book but i'm very happy to talk about some of the habits and the, the ideas that are contained inside of it but i i i cannot think of a of a book in this genre that i can now say that i like less than this book Okay. This book is the worst book. Let's put a pin in that for one second because I have a theory. But I wanted to say about the audiobook. Mm-hmm. I know that the audiobooks are torture. But the reason I do it is because I can integrate it into my life. Right, yeah, yeah. I don't have to like take the time to sit and read the book because I don't do a lot of sitting and reading time in this way. Right. But like I can be traveling, as I have been, and listen. I yeah. can be playing Stardew Valley and listen. So that's why I yeah. do this, right? Like I, I do that because it, it, I can integrate the audiobook into my working life and personal life easier than I can the physical book or Kindle. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I completely understand that, and that's what I was doing as well. Like I've been, I've been traveling a whole bunch, and so it's like, okay, great. While I'm standing online at security, right, I, I can hear about how we're going to synergize our plus one ideas, and it's great. <laughs> um, but I also found that at a certain point, just like I was no longer reading the book. I was simply not listening to the audiobook. And so what I ended up, the final, the final stage in my journey of I have to read this so I can talk about it at least a little bit on a podcast was, no joke, listening to the audiobook while looking at the Kindle version was, oh, was man, the only... Oh, bad news for you. It was like the <laughs> only way I could force the words to mean things in my head. Because I, I was aware, like after a while, even with the audiobook, it's like, I can't, I can't listen. So I had the weird experience towards the end of, audiobook cranked up to like two and a half x which is about my reading speed and then like quote reading through the book while the audiobook is playing in my head so that that's how i finished the book this morning (laughs) so here is my theory i have a theory about this which i kind of decided on pretty early Mm -hmm. and it helped me get through this book okay this book was published in 1989 right my theory is part of the reason that at first i was finding it infuriating and why i believe you find it infuriating is this book feels like you take every other productivity book ever written, put it into a blender, and Seven Habits pops out. 
And mm-hmm. I think it's the reverse of that. This was the book that started a lot of this stuff. So, so many of the things that feel like tropes of terrible business books are because you've heard them a million times because of this one. Mm-hmm. So, like, as when I started thinking about that, I approached this book differently. I was giving it more leeway because this book isn't trying to be annoying. I'm annoyed by this book because every marketing book, business book, and management material ever made since 1989 is trying to rip off The Seven Habits. And when I kind of, this is my theory, when I was able to accept that, I was able to give this book more leeway, and that's why I think I wasn't so annoyed about it. Yeah, no, you're you're totally right about that. I I, I think that that's not a theory. That that might as well just be like an accepted fact in the universe, right? That this, uh, like, when when you this is this is the book that had to introduce the idea of like paradigm shift into the into the language, mm-hmm. right? This is this is the book that that raises the idea of synergy into yep. the language, right? It's the first book that starts talking about all of that stuff. Uh, you know, my my comparison for this is. Um, is the example I always use, but I, I think of the the animated version of Ghost in the Shell as a movie, which is very hard for modern modern audiences to watch because it set up every single science fiction trope for the next thirty years. So when you watch the original, it feels like this thing is in, is incredibly unoriginal because you've you've seen all of the spin offs and all of the versions for the next thirty years on it. Like without a doubt, Seven Habits reading it now has that problem. And you've read so many more of these types of books than I have. So you yeah. have read this book 150 times. But my problem with it isn't that. Like, it, it, isn't, it isn't just that it's like, yes, this, this is this, this endless blender of random sentences from other books. Because I was also thinking that very much while I'm reading it. It's like, okay, this is the foundation of it. But it still felt like even, even with that in mind, like when he's talking about these various things, there's just so little there or, oh, or yeah. the like the ideas don't even make sense like his his whole chapter on I, I just i pick up pick up on synergy just as an example right because it's this like idea that has infected the business world where people are always synergizing their global strategies right but even even that whole chapter is like he, even here his his concept of synergy it's not like oh the original person had a great idea and it is it has since it has since been distilled down to a meaningless jargon word it's like no it was born as a meaningless jargon word yeah, like he he's using it wildly and consistently in a way that makes no sense across a whole bunch of different analogies so so that's why i don't feel like ah this thing was the thing that started and it got mutated over time it's like it was it was born in this inconsistent horrific way yeah it, uh, so yeah there are so many buzzwords and phrases in this book that he creates that by the end of it, you feel like you're in a bowl of soup. Like, so I, I've, this, is, this is from Habit 7. This was a note that's, this is the end, right? So I've made this note. And I say, by the point in this book, there are so many buzzwords that he uses that it is almost impossible to distinguish them from each other. Right, yeah. So I'll give a few of these, and we may talk about them. Emotional bank account, PC balance, intradependence, interdependence, personal renewal, daily private victory, synergize win-win solutions. By mm-hmm. the end of the book, he is throwing these words out like candy and to the point that you're like, does this word actually exist? I believed by the end of this book that the word intradependence existed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's like, I've heard it so many times now that it must be true. And it is, the intradependence is the idea of working with others. So instead of being independent, you're interdependent it's either inter Mm -hmm. or intra i also couldn't understand it because here's another thing that i have a problem with basically all business books i'm almost convinced this is another of my theories coming out of this book (laughs) Mm -hmm. i'm almost convinced that audiobook narrators or the people narrating audiobooks this one is narrated by stephen r covey the guy who wrote the book that they pronounce words weirdly just to make sure that you're paying attention Yes. Yeah, there's a few there's a few of those in here where it's like this is a normal word, dude, right? Like, like he no says way. truths in a way I've never heard before. He goes yeah. truths. It's like the longest word with a v in it. It's like I don't understand <laughs> what you're doing. Like the, he's, some words like nobody says them like this. I'm mm-hmm. convinced that they do this just so you pay attention because you're like I don't understand the word that he just used. It's mind-blowing. A couple of months, so I'm now getting worked up now. So here are a couple mm. more frustrations about this book. The first habit begins at two hours and twenty two minutes in. Oh wow! I didn't realize it was that long. <laughs> so I I have the unabridged, which again, don't know why I do this. But my version mm-hmm. includes a um, 
a forward, which is mind-blowingly just up in the stratosphere, Mm -hmm. where he's talking about his son. And I just can't believe it's true. Like, Mm -hmm. Like with many of these stories, there are many stories in this book where I'm like, okay, Covey, that does that didn't happen. Something like that may have happened, but that didn't happen. And the idea is that his son was failing in everything. He was terrible at school, terrible af- at athletics, just couldn't get anything right in his life. They started to apply the seven habits to him before they became the seven habits, right? Like they just started to change their behavior. And he ended up being the most popular kid in school, homecoming mm-hmm. king twice, <laughs> grade A valedictorian. <laughs> And the captain of the football team. (laughs) Right. And he won the Nobel Prize. (laughs) Now, I did a little bit of investigation, and his son was a successful American football player. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe the rest of it. Like, I can't. Maybe he was all of those things, but beforehand was not failing, unpopular, and couldn't run. Like, I just can't, in my mind, believe that this is true. And the thing is, they may be true. If it is, whatever. But when you read these books, you're like, this can't be. Because you know there are lies throughout this book. He also found a magical hotel, by the way, which is like... Oh, oh my God, yeah. I have that highlighted. <laughs> we can get to that later. Um, but yeah, this is one of the things that I didn't remember about the book at all. And I was astounded on the on the reread is everything relates to his children and his family. It, it, it's it's I was astounded, astounded yeah. by how much of this book is focused around marriage. Yeah. So many things. I was like, this is a business book. But like honestly, the major focus of the seven habits is applying them to your family life. And I was like, what is this book? Like this was mm-hmm. it was so different to what I was expecting in that way. Everything is to do with his family. Even like delegating his son to mow the lawn, right? Like, oh my god, the mowing the lawn story. Yeah. So, but but this this is exactly the kind of thing where it's just like I don't I don't believe these stories that you're telling about your children. Like, or yep. because they're it. He's always telling stories about some kind of leave it to beaver perfect family where they're just they're having conversations and then people just realize, oh, I understand everything now and 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 like stuff just works out perfectly fine, even when it doesn't. There's some there's some like it, it's. The stories are crazy. There's, there's one that I highlighted as, as to me, a perfect example of like, I'm sorry, th- this story didn't happen where, I don't know if you remember this one, but he's talking about not wanting to go see Star Wars with his daughter. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and and the daughter says, oh, dad, I, all right, I know you don't like Star Wars. You've slept through it before, right? You don't, you don't want to see this movie. Um, and then, and then his daughter, who is like, how old is the daughter in this story? But she, she says, quote, but you know why you don't like Star Wars? It's because you don't understand the philosophy and training of a Jedi Knight, right? What? I said, you know, you know, the things you teach, dad, those, those same things you <laughs> teach are the training of a Jedi Knight. And then I said, really, let's go see Star Wars. And we did. She sat next to me and gave me the new paradigm. I became her student, her learner. It was totally fascinating. And I could begin to see out of the new paradigm the whole way a Jedi Knight's basic philosophy and training is manifested in different circumstances. Right? It's like... This didn't happen. This, there's no way that your no. daughter's like, let me tell you about the philosophy and training of a Jedi Knight. Because also, like, this movie is taking place in the 80s. Like, this is, this did not happen. There is no way that your daughter was like, let me explain to you how what Jedi Knights do is exactly what you do, Dad. You're, you're just like a Jedi. Hey, like, Covey, no. you're a Jedi. No, yeah, Covey exactly. wanted to be a Jedi is what this is all about. I read that story because that one is particular crazy. Yep. But, but just imagine like every single page there is some quick story about his family and like learning things from his children or or teaching things to his children in ways that when you're on the 100th one of them like this is not believable like this is crazy i think the worst one for me is this is towards the end of the book he's talking about how him and his family took a year away to hawaii oh god God. yeah and he talks about how you know the kids would go to school and then he would pick them up on like it's called like a Honda Trail Master or something Trail Cycle, which mm-hmm. is a motorbike. Where he said that all four of the family got on the bike and would drive <laughs> right, to the yeah. beach. He's like, <laughs> I would sit on my wife would sit behind me, and the kid in between us, and one of them on my knee. I was like, how? How? Yeah. It's like are you circus performers. Like, what are you doing? 
Well, well, that that kind of description to me re- reads like a thing where when when you're a psychologist and you start to unwind with someone false memories that they have, yeah. Right? Because it's like and it's like no, it's like, you oh yeah, we car. were all on the motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, it's like no, that can't possibly have been the case, right? Like let's let's start comparing this against real world things. Like there's no way that you were doing this in the way that you're describing. And then he would talk about how they would sit on the beach and just talk for hours, right? Like that every single day. And then he's talk telling the story about how. His wife would only buy Frigidaire appliances, which Mm -hmm. is a company, right? They make, like, white goods and stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was apparently a sore spot in their marriage because she would insist on these Frigidaire appliances. And for some reason, this caused huge problems with tons of emotional baggage That (laughs) because every time they needed to buy an appliance, they had to go to the next town. And they both were just dreading this conversation was coming. And every time it came, it was like the end of their marriage and they had so much trouble with it. And then she happened to remember that her father's business was saved by Frigidaire. How would you not Mm -hmm. remember that? How would you, why would you know you had this like undying love for this company and not remember yeah. it was because your dad's business was saved by their financing of their appliances? Yeah. And, and that, that again is, is an, ex- an example of like, okay, let, let's say that that story is, is true. This is also like almost a classic example of your, your wife is probably just manufacturing a memory about a thing that might have happened when she was a kid. Like it's so... It's so weird. It, it's so strange. So many of these You're stories, and they're all like just perfect. <laughs> I, I don't like it anymore. Because <laughs> 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 th- this is it, right? Like, and so, like, it, it suffers from this thing that all these books do. Which, why give mm-hmm. one example when you can list twenty? Yeah, yeah. Why oh. give one example when you can list twenty? There, now, I, again, I will, I will slightly in defense say that that in my memory, that the thing which we'll, we'll get to it, which I think was the one idea, is the one place that I think benefits from a bunch of examples. Uh, but most of the time, it, it totally doesn't. And the the, the 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 problem with a whole bunch of the examples is they are all these just so examples, right? It's like. Let me tell you a thing, and then here's an imaginary story about perf- how how it perfectly solved this situation, right? And it's like it's not a it's not a real life example of of what to do. Like just just to contrast with getting things done, which again I will say I don't think is a book which really holds up anymore. Uh, but one of the things I always find hilarious in that book is David Allen talks about the problems and projects that you have, and his problems and projects are always like hilarious rich person problems. So he talks about like, wh- like what's the first step to building your next uh, orchard, right? And it's like, well, you know, you need to, <laughs> what, you need to do all of, like that is, that is literally an example in the book at one point, right? But, but what, I, what, like, what I will appreciate about that is, okay, he may be giving a bunch of examples, but he works through like the specifics of this thing of like, here's, here's a thing, like let's break down the way that you're supposed to think about this. Whereas this book feels like a, like a whole bunch of like, parables about an imaginary family that are vaguely related to the ideas that he's pushing in the book and it's like okay this is my feeling throughout it is like there's no action and if yeah. if you read the book what you can also see and and what really started to bother me is his philosophy which there's a very weird and very brief afterward which re-emphasizes this idea but oh i didn't listen to the afterward i got to the end of the seventh habit and i was like i'm done i'm out yeah but his his philosophy in large part he talks about like he's constantly talking about making decisions to say to stay constant with your principles right like this is this is like over and over this is the drumbeat is like this the secret to living a good life is to have good principles and stick to them all right and and my frustration with that is like yeah that's the whole fucking problem, right? Like that like that's the hard thing to do is to make the right decisions, but so many of these things are like you need to set out some some ideas and then just stick to them. It's like, dude, just sticking to them is the hard part. And what I absolutely love is in this ridiculous story where he talks about having his son mowing the lawn. It is the oh, there's once in the entire book where he explicitly acknowledges like doing something is hard because his kid promises to mow the lawn and then doesn't. And then when he calls his kid out on it, his, his kid cries and says, oh, dad, it's so hard. And his in his internal monologue, he says, like, oh, what's so hard? Like, you didn't do anything. And then he has one line in the whole book where he says, well, the hard thing is sticking to the principles. Right. And then just blows right past it. And it's like, 
You've got a thousand pages upon which every page is just like the secret to making good decisions is to make good decisions. And it's like, there's nothing here, like there's nothing here to talk about. And it's this weird thing about choices. And there is a, there is a moment which blows my mind in the afterword at the very end of the book, which really sums it up, where he's talking about choices. And he literally, he literally just says something like, if your parents abused you as a child, that does not mean you have to abuse your own children. Right? You can choose not to abuse your children. And it's like, oh, oh, is that the problem? Like people are just making the, it's, it's oh my crazy, God. Oh, right? Wow. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it's uh. like, th- thanks for solving like these, these systemic societal problems by telling people who do bad things not to choose to do the bad things, right? It's so yeah, weird. Yeah, there, there are more examples of this. So in one of the, one of the many examples of relationship advice in this book, uh, there is a, somebody who came up to him at the end of a conference. Many people come up to Covey at the end of his speaking engagements to, to tell him stories. Oh my God, yeah. Was, was, this, was this the woman, the nurse, like who's working with the old man? Or was this another one? No, there was this so another many. one. This, okay. is, this one is, it's guys like, um, me and my wife, we don't love each other anymore. Oh, I have that highlighted too. Oh my God, it's amazing. Just, just <laughs> love them. But it's like, but we don't get, you just love, it just keeps saying over and over again, just love them, just love them. And it's saying mm-hmm. that, you know, love is a thing that is constructed by books and it's not a real thing and all you have to do is be attentive. And it's it's like, okay, the advice, like, there's probably some interesting stuff in this advice, but the way that he gives it is just so weird. Like, mm-hmm. just love them. Like, he's, that, that is his advice. Just love them. He just keeps saying it over and over again until the scales fall from the person's eyes and they can finally see as part of Covey's teaching. I think this is worth reading word for word. This this Please. weird yeah. like how to love how to love your wife <laughs> thing. It's like, okay, listeners, like strap in for a moment here. Yeah, you you going on a wild ride. Okay, so so here here's relationship advice from Stephen Covey. At one seminar where I was speaking on the concept of productivity, a man came up and said, Stephen. I like what you're saying, but every situation is so different. Look at my marriage. I'm really worried. My wife and I just don't have the same feelings for each other that we used to. I guess I just don't love her anymore, and she doesn't love me. What can I do? Love her, I replied. I told you, the feeling just isn't there anymore. Love her. Uh, You don't understand. The feeling of love just isn't there. Then love her. If the feeling isn't there, that's a good reason to love her. (laughs) But how do you love when when you don't love? My friend, love is a verb. Love, the feeling, is the fruit of love, the verb. So love her. End of chapter, right? Like, what? What the hell is this? Right? Like, but, but, like, the, but the, the, that is another version of the same story that gets told many times, which is like, just choose to do the better thing. And it's like, uh, okay, thanks, thanks, man. I'll I'll be sure to do that. It, that that one is, that one is is just astounding. Yeah, but th- there's many people at conferences and children, and like these these are all like tropes of this genre. But this one has so many weird ones, and it's like, by the end, I start feeling almost personally offended by the constant refrain of just do the thing that will make your life better and it's like screw you buddy like that is that is not an answer like that is not an action right you can't like the way to love your wife is just love her right like okay (laughs) right whatever (laughs) chill dude it's like all right yeah (laughs) do you want to love her what's your problem (laughs) let's talk about the habits I, uh, okay, I have yeah. more of these things to talk about as we go through, but I want to yeah. start talking about the habits. But, so, but yeah, let's let's if if we don't start talking about the habits, we're never going. We will never it. stop. But we'll never get to them. So let let's let's go through this again. I want to just state my position. I am infuriated by all of these things. I'm I am so angry about the things that happen in this book like that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't find myself just losing my mind like I did with the Emeth because I feel like in Emeth they were just relentless, and mm-hmm. I thought at least there were some breaks here where he was talking about some interesting stuff, and I. I do believe that this book has more than just one thing to take away from it. Today's show is brought to you in part by our friends at Hover. Building your online identity has never been more important. And with Hover, you find the domain that shows the world who you are and what you're passionate about. What I love about Hover is their customer support team, 
the fact that everything is super easy to set up and super easy to search for. So the customer support team is best in class. They have a Hover Connect feature, which I used just a couple of weeks ago for setting up the wedding website that I spoke about. I was able to get the domain name that I bought set up with my website in just a few clicks. I didn't have to enter in a bunch of DNS information. And also they have Who Is Privacy as well for free, so bad guys don't get my information. I really love Hover for these things. And look, I've mentioned stuff like getting a domain name for my wedding website. This is something that I needed and Hover made it simple. This wasn't one of those things where I had to sit and think and scratch my chin about what I was going to get. I knew what I wanted and I could go in and get it really easily. Whatever type of project or reason, no matter what it is, Hover has the tools that you need and the domain name options that you want to get it done. Like for example, what if you want to create a blog? Well, by using the .blog domain extension, you can tell everyone exactly what to expect. When they go to your website, they know they're going to get awesome and relevant content about you or your business rather than just a generic homepage because the site is called .blog. So let's say that you're a blogger or a company even that's trying to create new leads or inform your customer base or just you want to talk about what's going on in your life. You could use .blog instead of something generic like .com or .biz. People know what they're going to get when they see it. Stand out and build your online identity with the perfect domain name for you or your business. New Hover customers can get 10% off any of the over 400 name extensions by going to hover.com slash cortex, of course, including .blog. Our thanks to Hover for their support of this show. The habits are broken down into two and a half categories. The first three are classified as private victory um, and or independence. And then four to six are classified as public victory or interdependence, which is working with others. And the seventh habit is just about renewing all of the sixth. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's an interesting structure. Um, and, I, and I actually quite like the structure. So the first three are classified as proactivity, beginning with the end in mind and putting first things first. So habit one is proactivity. And the idea, and there's a great summary on Wikipedia for each of these. Um, and I pulled some of that out just to try and give a concise explanation for them. So be proactive is in understanding your circle of influence and your circle of concern. So the things that you can influence about yourself and the people that you need to be concerned about, the things that you need to try and change, and not to just sit and wait in a reactive mode, waiting for problems to happen before you take action. You should be out there and taking action. And a lot of it is about understanding the language that you use and the way that you think about things. So Mm. I really liked this one example of saying things instead of, I have to do something, You say that you choose to do something or Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of I wish I had done this to I can be this or I can do this. And Mm -hmm. I I really like this as a start because it was like saying to me, the, the reader, think about yourself. Think about the way that you approach problems. Think about the way that you approach opportunities and how you refer to them and try and understand the things that you are able to change and the things that you are able to kind of influence to change. And I found Mm -hmm. it to be an interesting way to start off. And it's something that I know that in my life, I have gotten better about over time. But there Mm -hmm. was definitely a period of time for me when I was in bank branch management where I was not being proactive. And I was more focused on the fact that these bad things are just happening to me. And I'm not, you know, and there's nothing I can do about it. Rather than what I ended up working out later was like, why am I doing this? I don't like this. I need to go out and change something. So I I did actually quite like this. It felt like a good start. It was just a shame that it started at two hours and 22 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Just a a small note before we move on. While while you did note that the first first habit comes in at two hours and whatever minutes, uh, one one of the... uh, remarks that I have here in my highlights is uh, the first promotion of the Stephen Covey business starts at exactly one minute into the yep. book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. yep. so, uh, uh, there was a, there's a little, little bit of a thing to notice there. Yeah, this is interesting because in the actual book, there's not a lot of it, right? Mm-hmm. Because he's talking more about being a teacher because that's what he was when he was mm-hmm. writing this book, mostly. Mm-hmm. But the foreword is after this book has changed his life and he is now a management consultant, right? So he's mm-hmm. doing these seminars and stuff, which he mentions in the book. But like, if I'm reading it correctly, like it wasn't what it ended up becoming. 
Mm-hmm. Like yeah, yeah. he doesn't make reference to the Covey business empire built based upon the Seven Habits during the book right. because it doesn't exist yet. But right, the right. forward is full of it, right? Which is <laughs> right. hilarious, <laughs> right? Yeah, it comes right out of the gate. Um, but I just I, I thought that was just kind of funny, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's whatever. But um, I, I also I also agree. Like the, the first chapter, it was interesting, and I'll say, like in fairness to the book, I think if it catches you at the right moment in your life, I genuinely think that that first chapter can open up a bunch of people's minds to the way that they think about things. Yeah. Purely the language stuff. Like that yeah, the, I found yeah, purely to be the, the most, language stuff. The most interesting one of the most interesting things of the entire book actually for me. Because it yeah. really made me think about, huh, how do I say this stuff and why do I say it that way? Yeah. You know, like I have to do this. Why do I have to do anything? I can choose. Right. Right. And yeah. I found it really interesting. Yeah, it, it was and um it reminded me of a little language thing, which of course was like a totally hopeless lost cause as, as a teacher. Um, but, but when I used to have kids come up and say like, oh, like I gave them a bad grade, like I, I would always use the language of like, no, you earned a bad grade, right? Or like, I didn't give you a bad grade, like you earned a bad yeah. grade. Just because again- You didn't again, turn like in it's... a good paper that I ended up changing until it became bad, right? Like it right, wasn't yeah. that bad when you gave it to me. <laughs> Yeah, and just like like just just changing a little bit of the language around that. It's like you you are an active participant in this process, right? You're you're not just sitting there and I'm handing out grades like there's a thing that's happening between the two of us. And I I do I do like I said I think if you're at the right stage in your life that this might this might just catch you in the in the right moment. And I I don't know I don't know what the timeline of, of this is, but um. I, I was just wondering because a lot of this reminded me of um, I have a, a relative who is a psychologist and works with like people who've been through some trauma and unwinding them about that and and talking about the process of teaching people to interrupt their own thoughts, like teaching people to catch themselves thinking in terms of the world is doing something to them versus you are an actor in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it was just, it's very, like I talked to her about, like it's, it sounds very interesting, like the, the way that she, she works with people to say, like if you have a fear of heights, like how, how do you work someone out through that? And, and part of it is like this change of, you are, you are an actor in the world, like you are not the result of all of the actions upon you. Um, so it was, like it was just kind of reminding me about uh, this thing, which uh, it's, I've gone through some of that sort of stuff and read some of this cognitive behavioral therapy. Like I've yes, looked into yes, some of that at p- times in my life. Like when I was struggling with some of my work stuff, mm-hmm. this was a great help to me was, was going through some of this stuff because there are some very valuable things in that, right? Like the, the idea of understanding that like you can't control everything, things happen and how do you react to them? And like, how do you change the way that you think and say stuff Mm -hmm. to be better in the world? Like it's, it is a very powerful thing. And when I was reading this part, this, well, when habit one was being read to me by Mr. Covey himself, I was reminded of a lot of these types of learnings and it was like, okay, this is good. Oh, that's that's interesting. Okay. So, so you saw the similarities to that too. Yeah. Uh I've I've only just heard about this in like a secondhand way. And I just think like, oh, okay, this, this sounds like a very similar idea. And 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 at least talking to my family member who does this, it seems like if if you've got serious business about behavior change in humans, this seems to be one of the most effective ways to go about it. Like as far as, as far as we know right now, I, I also, I did just really like the, um, Okay, so, so I think there is a way that he phrased something, uh, which is a, a better way of phrasing an idea that you and I have sometimes spoken about, like how we don't really follow the news, right, or in, or intentionally not following a whole bunch of things. And I'm I'm always I'm always trying to encourage people to to sort of I don't want to say like be less aware of the world, but in a sense I, I kind of am, like focus on the things that you can do. But I, I did really like his phrasing of this idea that. That everybody has this circle of things that they're concerned about, and that circle is larger than the things that you can influence. And I, I, I did think that language change was is is an interesting way yeah. to frame it because it's like, oh, of course, people get trapped and caught up in constantly thinking about the things that are inside their circle of concern, but that are outside their circle of influence. And I just I thought like that's a really interesting way to differently frame uh, mm-hmm. th- this idea, and I, I think that is also again like maybe for a person at the right moment that idea can be really liberating 
to recognize that like, yes, there are, there are many things you may be concerned about over which you have absolutely no influence. And so you have to make a decision about not obsessively thinking about that stuff or working to expand your circle of influence so that you can actually do something about it that is no longer out, outside of, of your power. So I, I, I thought that was also like a, a, a good way to frame this concept of, of like selective ignorance in a way. Habit two is begin with the end in mind. Now, I thought that this habit went off the rails incredibly quickly, but turned me around. So this habit is about envisioning what you want in the future so you can plan and work towards it. And to be effect and the idea is to be effective, you need to act based on principles and constantly reviewing a mission statement that you create. So mm -hmm. there are two main things in this part, which is one, the envisioning of the future, and then the second is the mission statement. Now I it was really interesting to me because these things were both introduced. And my mind was changed about each of them in a 180. So the first is, the way he begins talking about envisioning your future is, let's picture your funeral. And my eyes nearly rolled right out of my head. I <laughs> know. Oh, yeah, that, I, I, the, I had the exact same experience of like, oh. <laughs> and he's, the idea is, what would you like to hear people say about you? Like, And the idea is someone that you work with, someone who would talk about your character, and someone who would be a friend or family member. And mm -hmm. what difference would you like to have on people's lives? And he says to work out, like, you know, write down what you would want. And by the end of this, whilst he was clearly going for a shock factor with the let's picture your funeral, I found it an interesting exercise mm -hmm. because trying to think about what do I want to be thought as? Mm -hmm. like, people that I work with, people that I care about, how do I want them to think of me? Like, how would I want them to describe me? It doesn't need to be at my funeral, right? But that, that was a bit too much. But what? What? Do, and I, I found <laughs> that to be worry, an, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> I found that to be an interesting exercise that I took something from. Right? Like, I wrote some stuff down, and I was like, I, I, I like this. This is a good thing to think about because then, how does that affect your life and the things that you do? Like if you mm -hmm. want to be by the end of your life seen as these three or four things, how do you get there? And what path do you take to make sure you don't deviate from them? I found mm -hmm. that to be very interesting. So beginning with the end in mind. So setting up your plan now for how you want to be seen at the end. I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also I, I, I couldn't deal with the funeral thing. So and, it was and, too yeah. much. It was silly. Yeah. And for me, it's it's overblown and like weirdly pompous in a, in a way. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, you're yep. going to be surrounded by all these these loving people. Nobody nobody has a better thing to do on a Tuesday afternoon than go to your funeral, right? It's like whatever. Um, but but it, it, again, it does it does have a point, and there's there's a way of. I think the life scale is too big. But it, it is an interesting question when people are working on projects of, um, I kind of like to phrase it as like, what's the best thing that could possibly come out of, of what you're working on right now? Like if, like if everything went absolutely great, what's the, what's the biggest possible upside of, of this thing that you're working on? And, and very often, like if you, if you sort of think about that, you can realize that some, some projects just aren't worth spending the time on. Um, but, but people can end up starting them. I, th I think because they're sort of skipping this idea of, of, thinking about what does the final version of this look like um so yeah I, I think the the whole arc of your life doesn't doesn't really work for me but i i, I think this is a valuable concept on a smaller scale of, of have a clear idea in your mind of, of what you're trying to achieve uh and and that will help direct your actions towards what it is you actually want to need to do in order to make that happen then the second part of this is the personal mission statement, which is the thing that you create and adapt and update throughout your life to try and keep you on the course towards what you want to be remembered for. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's an interesting idea. Until the personal mission statement became three to four to five to six to seven paragraphs long. Mm -hmm. I was expecting a sentence or two, right? Mm -hmm. Like a real kind of like a thing you could put on the wall and you could look at it every day and be like, that's what I want to be. But these personal, personal mission statements were like novella length for each person yeah. that was talking about them. And it completely lost me, 
right? Like, uh, it's, I was it's not surprising. Up. Like, Covey's not Covey's not uh, a brief guy, right? No, so it's not, not surprising that his his personal mission statement would be like, let's sit down and write a little novella. But then, like every example he was giving for these totally one hundred percent real people was the same, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it was like it was so frustrating to me because. It built built me up, right, to this idea where I was like, I am on board with this. This is really great. And then it was like, you've you've destroyed it because I don't want to have to sit on a beach for an hour like you do every year <laughs> to write my mission statement. Like, mm-hmm. this is something that if I'm going to do this, I want it to be a short thing. He actually, at one point, compares it in length and importance to the America Constitution. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yep. <laughs> right? It's like, do you understand that maybe you've gone too far at this point? Right. And also that's that's probably a big ask of like someone who's reading this book and is trying to turn their life around. You're like, look, just sit down and write a constitution for you. Yeah. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> so again, like the, I might take this and twist it. Right. And and because I, I have now the things that I think about, right? Like what what do I want to be remembered as? Maybe I should try and turn that into something which is a bit, little bit more realistic for me. So it's like this again. This is why I am a little bit more on board with this book than Emeth, because mm. you know we're not that far into it, and I've come away with some things that, whilst not perfect, I actually think work pretty well. Mm-hmm. You know, like the circle of influence, circle of concern. I think is 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 very interesting, and it, and it it perfectly explains something that I struggle to explain to people, same way that you do. Mm -hmm. And the idea of beginning with the end in mind and kind of how you want to move towards creating something which can encapsulate that, there's some interesting stuff in that for me. Before we move on, Mike, though, before we get on to Habit 3, I just want to pause here for a moment to point out that Habit 2 is when Stephen Covey visits the same magic hotel. Yes. (laughs) That is in E-Myth Revisited. (laughs) When When I got to this point... I actually had almost like a childish glee of like, oh my God, it's another magic hotel. Like I'm sitting on the airplane. I'm like, T-E-E, this is amazing. I, I, I think I, I was walking through Covent Garden and I think I started laughing out loud when he when he was talking about his magic hotel. Our favorite part of the Emeth Revisited is this hotel that the, the author goes to, which is completely fictional, cannot exist in real life. Yeah. I did some digging. Apparently this hotel is a chain and it does exist. But again, mm-hmm. I don't believe that it goes the way that it does, where this hotel created their own personal mission statement, which just funnily enough is the same vernacular that he uses when the book has not been published, because right. apparently that's a thing. And that mm-hmm. ev- literally everybody in the company, from the housekeeping to the janitors to the bellboys to the everything, everybody mm-hmm. sat down and was 100% engaged in creating this personal mission statement. Like, don't lie to me. Tell me if this thing exists, that's fine. But it wasn't like that. It it just doesn't work like that. It, it, yeah, there's there's several things here. I mean, according to the book, this mission statement for the hotel was the hub of a great wheel. It spawned the thoughtful, more specialized mission statements of particular groups and employees. And it was used as the criteria for every decision that was made. It clarified what people stood for, how they related to the customers, how they related to the to each other. Right. Like, this is this is one of these moments, and there's there's a uh, an example that happens a few pages earlier, which is a similar thing. Which I, I don't know how to describe it, but I think of a kind as a kind of CEO disease. Where okay, let's say this hotel existed, and let's say the hotel got everybody from the janitors to the CEO together, and they did all work on a mission statement and some and right and a, and a document was created. Right. I don't know about you, but my experience doing that kind of stuff like when I was working for someone, is that the rank and file employees are all thinking like this is a total BS day where we have to have a silly pointless meeting. And the people on top seem to think that something amazing has occurred. And there's there's like a there's like a great difference in the experience of what people think is happening in the room. Right. And and so it's like even if this happens and I believe it is like I just don't believe that the like the janitors at the hotel are like, you know what? I feel really on board with the value and position of this hotel. Now. Like, I just don't believe that. I think the va- the janitors are busy thinking like, man, I got a lot of stuff to clean up today. And, and this meeting is just making me have to stay after hours to work longer. Like, I think that's what's really happening when this, when this occurs. The closest I've ever gotten to this, is I worked for a company when I was in college mm-hmm. where it's a big company. It's a big department store chain in the UK where they distribute 
the company's profits to the employees. Okay, right there, that is genuinely meaningful, yeah. right? That, that's, a, that's a different thing because it's not like words on a page, it's money in your pocket. So this is a huge company, make a lot of money, and every year, every single person gets a bonus, which is a mm-hmm. percentage of their salary from Interesting. the person who is pushing shopping carts through the car- parking lot to the CEO. Everybody gets the same percentage. Obviously, the amount differs, but everybody gets the same percentage. That percentage right. shrinks or grows depending on how well the company does. And I saw things in that working for that company that I have never seen since. Like, for example, the last person who leaves the staff changing room turns the lights off at night because the electricity bill goes towards the bonus. Like mm-hmm. little things like that where I saw a lot more buy-in in that company than I've seen in any other company because there is an actual thing that you can point to to show that right. if we all work towards this together we get something yeah that that is it that is a perfect example of of what i always feel is like what really matters is it's not it's not words it's not trying harder it's a structure that encourages or rewards the actual behavior that you want mm-hmm. all right and, and you know in this in this book it's so clear that it's like if you're the leader of a company, your words are just our magic pixie dust that's spread on your employees, and then and then they just behave in ways that you want them to do. And it's like that is that is not the way it is. And yeah, your your description of that is interesting. That's like, oh look, if you set up an actual structure that encourages the behavior that you want, you're probably going to get more of the behavior that you want. But the but the thing is like that might cost you in other ways, right? You can, you can't just say costless words and get the same result. Habit three, put first things first. So this talks about the difference between leadership and management. Leadership in the outside world begins with personal vision and personal leadership. And it also talks, oh. which I, all of that stuff, leadership and management, I have no time for it. I've heard too much of it. I, I can't talk about it. I have literally no personal notes about that entire part of the book because I could give a crap about the difference between leadership and management. Yeah. Right, yeah. That this kind of stuff is like skim, skim, skim. But but for me, habit three, put first things first. This is where when I say my review is one good idea in a thousand pages, this is the chapter that to me had the one good idea. Uh and Yes, and I I you, when I you was know reading what, it. You know what I'm going for? I yeah. knew you were gonna like this. Right, okay, yeah. So I don't know if this is Here's a question. I don't know if this is original to Stephen Covey. Like I've, I've, I was, I was trying to do a little bit of a digging, of digging around, and it seems like this idea predates him. But it doesn't matter because this is the first place that I came across this idea, where he talks about time management matrix, and the time management yeah. matrix is this four by four grid, where you talk about all, all of your, every, everything that you have to do, you can categorize in a couple of ways, right? You have things that are urgent and things that are not urgent and you have things that are important and you have things that are not important. So you can think about your tasks in that way. And that ends up with what he he labels as these little boxes, right? So like box one is stuff that is urgent and important, right? And then you have like box three is stuff that is urgent, but not important. And, And you can move around all these different categories. And this is the thing that I really like because it's a, it's a clear way to frame your work that I think is non-obvious to lots of people. And the idea that it is so easy to get sucked up into work that is urgent but not important, like this, like this is a death trap of productivity. And like, I remember really trying to apply this in a whole bunch of ways and, and, and really, really feeling like I get this idea that in, in order to make significant progress, like you're going to have to drop a bunch of stuff that is urgent but not important and instead just focus on the things that are not urgent but are important. Like there's, there's trade-offs. You're going to have to let some stuff slide. And here is a good matrix for making a decision about in the universe of the infinite number of things that you can do these are the things that you should drop and this is the one section of the book that i think benefits from he has more concrete examples here where he's talking about like 
you're having a conversation with someone and then the phone rings while you're talking to them. Like the phone is the thing that is urgent, right? But the person that you're talking to is important, but it's incredibly hard for almost everybody to like resist the, the ringing of the phone. And he goes through a bunch of these things. And I, I think it's really good. And I also like he, you know, he's talking about this idea that a lot of these longer thing, longer term things that you can work on that are not urgent but important are also the things that give you more time later because like you're, you're establishing a much more solid foundation about how your routine and how your work life goes. And so th this to me is like the core of the book is this little section, which is at the end of, of habit three. And I think it's the, the most valuable per page section of the book. So I did really like this. Um, I liked the idea. Uh, one of the things that comes out of this is learning to be able to say no to things right? from knowing that you have a better yes available to you. Yeah, yeah. I loved, I mean, I've heard a million times and said a million times about being able to say no and understanding how mm -hmm. to be able to say no and actually saying no. But the idea of the second part of that, which is because you know there are better yeses available to you, is very interesting to me. Like understanding mm -hmm. what is important to you so you can help better gauge opportunities. Like if you get something that comes to you which is urgent but not important and you can say no to it, say no to it because there might be something that is urgent and important that you will need to deal with soon. And like a lot of these like meetings, many meetings that mm -hmm. might come mm -hmm. up, yeah, you meetings, could probably yeah, say no example, to, yeah. right? Like you maybe mm -hmm. don't need to be at that meeting because you have something that you know is going to be there which is important for you. So th the idea of knowing you have better yeses available, understanding what is important to you and what is urgent to you and focus on those things and then finding ways to delegate and or not do the other stuff, very powerful way of thinking about it. And you know, drawing out this grid, the time management matrix that he talks about, um, I've drawn it out in my Apple Notes as he was explaining it, and I liked the mm -hmm. way that that all looked. It's difficult to explain, but simple to see. And you can mm -hmm. find this stuff, and I'll find some links and put them into the notes so you can see what it looks like. Because if you can actually see it, it starts to make a lot more sense. The rest of this chapter, though, a lot of it, maybe like two-thirds of it, is talking about time management methods. Didn't listen, mm -hmm. didn't care. It was just happening to me. I'm not interested in <laughs> yeah, a book yeah. from 1989 talking to me about time management because the tools are not the same anymore. And I know some of the fundamental pr purposes and the fundamental ideas will be the same, but he is at points talking about specific functions and tools and like planners and notebooks. It's like, no, like I might or might not use something like this, but there are better systems out there now, stuff like bullet journaling, which I'm more interested mm -hmm. in looking at than listening to Stephen Covey in 1989 telling me how to manage my time. Right, I feel yeah. like a pre-internet age book is maybe not the best place to get this stuff from. Yeah, no, it's it, it's not good for this stuff. And while I do really like that section, and and you know, it's it's maybe like three or four pages where he's he's going through how to think about this. It then I feel like oh, the book the book briefly elevates to something good, and then it quickly descends yeah. because at the end there, there's there's a section where where he's posing the question to himself about like. But how do you know what is important? And like, well, that's a, that's a good question, right? Like, how, how do you know what is important in your life? And, and the answer is your principal center, your self-awareness, and your consciousness can provide a high degree of intrinsic security, guidance, and wisdom to empower you to use your independent will and maintain integrity to that which is truly important. It's like, go to hell, man, right? Like, that is not an ant, like... You'll just like this is this is again like the recurring theme of like you'll just make good decisions like oh you'll just know what's truly it was like don't, like don't say anything if you're gonna say that because you might as well not say anything and it, it infuriates me but yeah it the the after that section like the chapter rapidly descends and I do have to say we're up to we're up to habit three and from from this point on the book to me descends rapidly into worthlessness like i think 99 percent of the value is in the first three chapters and you could take those three first three chapters and decrease them by 75 percent and get out out from the book most of, of what you're going to get out of it okay so i mostly agree with you and i wonder if this is a thing about me and you as opposed to the book right? okay what so do you mean the first three chapters are focused uh, 
mostly on working on your own skills and how you make yourself more effective. The mm-hmm. next three are about working with other people in what seems to be focused on large groups and lots of people. And I think that there mm-hmm. is a lot of this stuff which is like, how are you more effective in a business meeting with 12 people in the room? How are you more mm-hmm. effective in doing a deal with a multinational corporation? Like mm-hmm. things that I think that me and you have mostly moved away from in our lives because that's not the type of work that interests us. Like we are more focused on being independent and having our own small businesses as opposed to being a cog in a huge machine, which I think mm-hmm. habits four, five, and six seem to focus a lot more on. Like mm-hmm. they seem to be really focused on working in a corporation. That's what I'm trying to get to with this. Like they seem to be way more focused on how do you become the best employee out of the 10,000 employees of your company. Mm-hmm. And and I wonder if maybe me and you don't take so much from this because I don't, I didn't really, I, all of the stuff that I like is in one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Four, five, and six. There is some nuggets in there that are interesting, but there is like one or two of the habits that are just completely pointless to me. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's just something about how me and you think or if they are mostly that way. I don't know. Yeah, there there is something to that, that this is less focused to us. Um, It's funny. I didn't so much get the feeling that this is necessarily part of being a very large group. Like Obviously, the, the whole point of the next three is it's a, it is about working with people but I, I didn't have that feeling so much that it's it's like you're you're a cog in this machine um mm. maybe it's partly because he's so still much incredibly talking about his family uh like in win-win solutions for him and his wife and there his children a, there is a possibility that i'm applying this to things that i have experienced yeah that, that you're, you're right. thinking of it in this way but i i also um i also think that it it, it the the like the ratio of the idea to the practicality of it drops to absolutely nothing. Like the the win win chapter in particular. This is habit four. Think win win. Yeah, habit four. Think win win has some of the most crazy stories in in terms of the way to come up with win win solutions is to have a great win win solution for everybody, and and that's like just over and over again where it's like. Ah, oh, there's two people who didn't agree, but then someone came up with a win-win solution, right? That that served them both. And there's something that to me that felt like so artificially constructed about these scenarios. And it's like, man, most of the time, if you're having a, a real disagreement with someone, it's like the hard part is finding a win-win solution. It's not the idea of, gee, I wish there's something that both of us could get out of this, right? Like it's it's. I found that these next chapters just have very, very little actionableness in them. And it, and it goes into real crazy town of like, things are good when they're good and, and do the right stuff. There was a lot of habit four, think win-win, that was gibberish to me, mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The amount of different win-lose, lose-win, lose-lose win, lose-lose-lose. Oh, lose, lose, lose. Oh, I couldn't God. follow <laughs> it. Couldn't follow it. Um, there is, it reminded me, there is a scene in the office, I think it's like a whole episode, Oh my god! I was thinking of the exact same thing. Yeah, win, I know what you're win, talking about. Yeah. Win, like it's like oh my, they must have got it from this book. I can't imagine any other way. But it's the idea is balancing decisions and actions in such a way that everybody benefits, and that mm-hmm. relationships don't get damaged so you get what you want, or relationships don't get mm-hmm. damaged because you've given in to somebody else. There is something interesting in that, um, which is oh, it relates to something I did we didn't talk about, which is the emotional bank account. Mm -hmm. The emotional bank account is something a part of habit three. This is one of the many ideas that Covey creates. However, whilst again, he goes on way too long talking about this, the idea of the emotional bank account I found to be an interesting one. And the idea is that the amount of trust that you build with somebody helps you work with them in whatever it is in your life, family, business relationships. And you make deposits to the bank account through doing good things, and you make withdrawals from the emotional bank account through mistakes that you make, bad things that you do. But they're just withdrawals because you've made so many deposits that they just take a little bit from it rather than destroying everything. This is the emotional bank account. Again, 
I liked it when he proposed it, but by the end of the book, I'd heard it too many times. But he <laughs> applies the win-win idea to the emotional bank account because if you are not thinking in a win-win scenario, you may withdraw too much from the bank account because people are losing, that kind of idea. It, it, these two things, they marry into each other in a way of trying to make sure that you balance decisions so that everybody remains happy and trustful in a relationship of some description. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the win-win stuff, it's like, he could have actually spoken about it in five minutes, but instead he took an hour and a half. Like, there is too much stuff in this, and it becomes baffling to understand by the time that he's done with it. <laughs> like, just, like, I don't... I, I, had, I tried and could not get my head around it. But the idea, effectively, is just, if everybody wins, it's better for everybody's happiness in the long term. Like, you don't right. want to shaft somebody now because later on you may lose their business, you know? Um, and he gives some wild examples of huge deals he left on the table and then companies come back and give them every penny that they've ever made just for the pleasure of working with him. But I will say in my work, in my business, part of what I do is advertising sales. I have always tried to work in this way of like, if you try and have a good relationship with people, they're maybe going to be more likely to come back to you in the future. And if you maybe try and squeeze every penny out of somebody, you may harm the relationship. Like, that is the nugget here, which is interesting. But the problem with this habit, with this chapter, is it's incredibly overblown to the point of almost nonsensicalness. Yeah, and it's all, there's also something about this chapter which strikes me as... Um, this may be unfair, but it strikes me a, a little bit as like, let's just teach murderers not to murder. Like, like I think people who are really focused on the idea of like I'm gonna I'm gonna screw over my business partners to get every last penny today. Like I don't I don't think those people you're gonna do a great job of explaining the concept of long term human relationships. Like, I I think people are again like in my experience in business as well. It's like people are already naturally on board with this idea or they aren't, and I ju I just don't think there's a lot of motion across the aisle on this topic. Uh, so it, it strikes me as a, a like a somewhat pointless topic. Today's episode of Cortex is brought to you by Timing, the automatic time tracking app for Mac. Hey, time tracking. We spoke about that a bunch on this show. Some of you love it. Some of you find it tricky. It doesn't matter what it is. I know that time tracking can be a tricky thing, mostly for a lot of people because you have to start and stop timers. It interrupts your workflow. And honestly, you often forget to do it sometimes. But why should you be the one that has to do all that work? Timing automatically tracks how much time you're spending in each app, document, and even website. So you no longer have to worry about starting or stopping a timer ever again. And because timing collects more data than a regular time tracker, its use extends far beyond billing hours. It shows you exactly when you were using which app or website, when you slacked off, and how productive you've been, so you know how to improve your productivity going forward. But Timing knows that your work doesn't just happen on your Mac, and that's why Timing's timeline automatically makes suggestions for filling gaps in your timeline, and can ask you what you did offline every time you return to your Mac. That way, you'll never forget to enter a meeting again. There are loads of great graphs and charts that break down not just the apps that I've been using, but also categorizations of the types of tasks that I will be completing in them. These categories can be completely customized. So when I'm, for example, in Logic, I can say, oh, whenever I'm in Logic, I'm editing a podcast. And that's an easy thing to do. And then everything that I categorize as podcasts can all go into one bin, or into one category, no matter what type of app it is. Timing can even give you a sense of what your most productive times are based upon the data it sees from a perspective of weekdays all the way down to hours, which is awesome. These tools are great for just entering this information, but what you really get the benefit from is being able to get graphs and charts and statistics and figures because then you can use the information that you're logging or the information in Timer's case that is being logged automatically for you because it's awesome like that to make some real changes about the way that you get your work done. You can download the free 14-day trial by going to timingapp.com slash cortex and save 10% when you purchase. And timing is also available on Setapp. Just check out the timing website for more details on that. So go to timingapp.com slash cortex, find out more right now, get the 14-day free trial, save 10%, or check it out on Setapp as well. Timing, stop worrying about time and focus on doing your best work instead. 
Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. <laughs> Use empathetic listening to genuinely understand a person, which compels them to reciprocate the listening and take an open mind to being influenced by you. Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay, so if I was going to say the one interesting thing in this, diagnose before you prescribe. That's all this needs to be. He explains it pretty well with another ludicrous example of how mm-hmm. like everyone in his town was at a football game and oh, yeah. the his only doctor they had yeah. and his do- daughter was sick and she was a newborn and there was medicine. Like, it was this wild thing <laughs> that explains the idea of before you try and tell someone what to do, listen to them first. Right, yeah. That's kind of it. Yeah. But it is massively overblown. Ethos, pathos, and logos comes up at one point. I, I didn't get what that was all about. The whole idea of empathetic listening is interesting. You know, you you mimic what somebody says, rephrase it, reflect the feelings, right? So, like, you're listening to what people are saying. You're showing them that you're listening by repeating to them what they're saying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's some interesting stuff in there. But this has one of the most overblown examples that he gives that I've been saving for this moment. Which yeah, is when okay. he is talking to his son about being a mechanic. Oh god, okay. Do you remember this one? I'm I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember because th- this one was one of the like I'm skipping the fastest through here because I I know it's like yeah I'm on board with the idea of trying to understand someone before before you before you do these things and I was I was having a hard time so start start me with the mechanic story because I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. So he he's saying about. I think he, I don't remember if he's saying this is his son or he's just creating an example, right? <laughs> of, and I think he might mention this at one point about a kid who, yeah, he he does actually say like this is one. He's just posing an idea here, right? It's like maybe mm-hmm. imagine this happening: a kid who comes to their father and doesn't want to go to school anymore and says, "I don't want to go to school anymore." And he plays out this conversation. He plays both Mm -hmm. sides of this conversation. And the kid is like, I don't want to go to school. And the dad's like, well, we worked really hard to send you to school. And like, et cetera, et cetera. And he's playing not only both of these people, but also this like Greek chorus of explaining the imagination (laughs) and (laughs) mind of how each people were feeling Mm -hmm. at this moment of like, Mm -hmm. and and then he plays it again, but speaking both as the per- as the child, but also as the child's inner monologue at that moment of being yeah. like, he doesn't want to listen to me. Why? Right. Why does he hate me? And then plays this other way of like, if you did it with empathic listening, mm-hmm. how it would improve the situation to the point where the kid who doesn't want to go to school because he's talking about like. There's a friend of his or like a friend of a family who's become a mechanic and they've done well and they didn't go to school. Why don't I do that? This mm-hmm. is like how the first two examples of this goes. And the dad's like, being a mechanic is ridiculous. You need to go and be a lawyer. I don't know why Covey hates mechanics so much, but apparently he does. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really he hates super mechanics. weird. Really hates mechanics. It's very strange. Almost as much as he hates television. Also mm-hmm. very strange. Um, <laughs> like he, he's talking about like, oh, don't be a mechanic. Blah, blah, blah. And then it gets to a point where the the, the final way where the, the father is using empathic listening, the kid is explaining, oh, but you know, I want to be a mechanic. And, and the kids and then the dad's like, but does Joey have such a great life? And the kid's like, I don't know. To the point where the kid also hates mechanics and he loves right. school. It's like this, this isn't how this conversation would go. It genuinely ends, though, with him saying... Mm-hmm. Owning up to the fact that this is probably not how this conversation would go. Like that's mm-hmm. how he finishes this. In, like it's like a twenty-minute thing, and he's like, <laughs> "I know." It's like I have created this example, and I know maybe this isn't how it would go. And there are a bunch of different ways that it could go, but this is how empathic listening might help. I'm like, "Oh my god, <laughs> this is so ridiculous that he can't even finish it by owning, like by like owning it. He has to mm-hmm. own up to the fact that this is probably not how this conversation would play out. <laughs> like, why are we doing this then? Mm-hmm. It, yeah, this this was one of the most wild in the book. Like. It, I really, I'm like listening to it and I just couldn't understand why he felt the requirement to do it in this way. Yeah, I, me- I remember now going through this and just being 
confused at the multiple like i just i don't understand what's happening here like it's just listening to this thing and my brain's not fully paying attention mm-hmm. and it's like wait a minute is this the same story again like am i going senile or is he going senile? like i yeah, i just remember this being like a weird a weird confusing mess is like is there some kind of art project happening in the middle of this book like i don't i don't get it <laughs> habit six synergize Synergize. (laughs) oh (laughs) this is maximum crazy this is maximum crazy in the book this is where it goes off the rails in just an amazing way because here stephen covey is is trying to say like synergy is the result of all of the things that we have talked about before and so it's like you know all these buzzwords like we're bringing them all back people like and they're all going to be in a row and we're going to talk about all of them together and and this to me this chapter is maximum crazy uh like his his definitions of synergy his stories um there's one story at the end that i particularly like uh but but yeah this this one is this one is rough i think there is not a single sentence of value in the entire chapter so the idea of habit six is to combine the strengths of people through positive teamwork so as to achieve goals that no one could have done alone all right um it's not compromise by the way compromise is not synergy no, no, compromise is not synergy. Compromise is one plus one equals one and a half, Mike. Okay, let me try and explain this. I don't know how I'm going to be able to. So apparently synergy is when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In synergy, you could get one plus one equals three. Or right. as he says, yeah. one plus one equals ten. Or ten thousand. Or fifty thousand. Right. I was like, what are you doing? Like, have you lost <laughs> your mind? Why are you saying these numbers? But compromising is not synergy. It is a lower form of win-win. If you compromise, it's like one plus one equals 1.5, which to be honest still sounds pretty good because it's, you know, it's like whatever. But one plus one equals 1.5, one, mm-hmm. but synergizing is one plus one equals three. Now, mm-hmm. dear listener, if you do not understand this, that's fine because I don't either. I don't know what the difference is. And I've, and I've listened to the whole book. Just, just to be, I mean, just to be clear, quote, Synergy is the essence of principle-centered leadership. It is the essence of principle-centered parenting. It catalyzes, unifies, and unleashes the greatest powers within people. All the habits we have covered us prepare us to create the miracle of synergy, which which is just like algebra, new algebra rules. And yeah, it's the the chapter is amazing. He's really obsessed with the idea of constantly referring to one plus one equaling some other number. Uh, like this is this is his constant go to with what yep. synergy means in this chapter to one of my one of my favorite little stories here, which is it's almost like the checkmate meme on the internet like like happening in in real conversation where i I don't know if you remember, but he's he's talking to a guy who's like doubting the concept of synergy um so again, as with all of these stories it somehow it somehow quickly turns to marriage and family like everything is marriage and family uh but so some someone is doubting that this this magic of synergy exists to stephen covey oh god i just remembered it yes <laughs> oh my god it's so good <laughs> yeah right and so so like he turn he turns to the guy and he, and and the, so the book says like I looked at the two of them, so it's the guy and his wife. Yeah, because yeah, th- this guy is having uh, th- they're having problems in their relationship, and for some reason, so he meets this guy obviously at the end of a conference, and right. he invites Covey to go to lunch with him and his wife, so he can listen to the way that they communicate. Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 this this is also a thing that I don't have a whole lot of tolerance for. Is like a lot of weird 1980s science about the concept of left versus right brain people I wonder how you'd feel about that yeah he's like he's a really left brain person and she's a really right brain person and like this is a weird idea that still still infects educational pedagogy today and like all of the stuff that this is based on is non-replicable and is nonsense so it's like okay whatever so but so stephen covey like professional psychologist phd is like oh these these are here's a line where he's like oh these are these are two half brain people living together like they're, they're having a hard time talking and and he says like you guys need to be more synergistic. And they're, and they're saying, oh, I don't understand what you mean by, by synergy. And so, the, again, resolution to fix this guy's marriage. Here's how it goes. Stephen Covey says, Do you have any children? I asked. Yes, two. Really? I asked incredulously, which feels a bit presumptuous there. Oh, um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, he said, and then so Stephen Covey says, How did you do it? And they said, What do you mean, how did we do it? 
You were synergistic, I said. One plus one usually equals two, but you made one plus one equals four. Now that's synergy. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And it's like, what? you're just counting things? Like, it, it's so yeah. weird. This like, is not, like, these people, they can't communicate. They struggle to communicate. They seem to kind of not really like each other very much anymore. But yeah. for some reason, you fixed it by saying they had kids 10 years ago? Like, I don't right, understand. Yeah. Right. The solution. <laughs> yeah, so this 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 is just maximum crazy in this chapter. Like it do, it doesn't make any sense. It's like in his mind, people can only have children if they're in a healthy functional relationship. Yeah, that that is a that is a good way to put it. Like he's he's like, "But your children are here." Like, well, I don't understand what why do you have a problem? Don't you understand that if you have children, that shows that you're you're great together. It's like, I don't know, man. Even from your telling of the story, it sounds like maybe they should get divorced like for the benefit <laughs> yeah. of the children. <laughs> oh, it's But I don't yeah, I don't know. I don't know so if he bad. can do minuses. Like can he do 1 minus 1 equals -4? No, like is that what seven. would happen to it the would family? It would still be a plus. Like okay. it's somehow in his mind, 1 minus one would be two million or something yeah, yeah it's Covey <laughs> hates math like he hates tv he, he, he at some point goes into this rant and i don't know where exactly it is mm -hmm. he is talking about how tv is mostly bad for us and there are some educational shows that are good and <laughs> we watch 40 hours a week of tv somehow and that in his household they watch seven hours a week and everybody mm -hmm. is happy with that like mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure why he gets into this, but like he seems to feel that like TV is a plague on society. It's very yeah. strange. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are a bunch of just digs out of nowhere at TV. Um, oh, yeah. I actually think it is in Habit Seven, which is mm -hmm. called Sharpen the Saw. So, so Habit Seven is about the continued improvement of the other habits. So it is taking everything that you have, making and and continuing over your life to build and renew resources, energy, and improve your health to create a sustainable, long-term, effective lifestyle. And you have to be able to sharpen the saw and make your life good so you can live the rest of the habits and it brings it all together. And this is broken mm -hmm. down into three major parts, which is physical renewal, which is exercise, mm -hmm. Something kind of referred to as good service, which can be considered as prayer or meditation or helping yeah. in your community, mm -hmm. and mental renewal, which is reading. This is where mm -hmm. he talks about the problem of TV because he believes that people should be reading all the time. Right, yeah, yeah. It's uh, the big, big books, push probably. for reading on there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had nothing about this one. This one, I, I, it was just because by this point, the technical debt that he has created with the phrases and the buzzwords is almost monumental. Like, yeah. There was a point in this book where it's like, you just said 50 words, and I think you created 15 of them. Like, I don't understand what you're talking about anymore, because <laughs> intradependence and interdependence, you use both of them, and I sometimes mm -hmm. don't know which one you're talking about. It's, it's, gets a, it's, it's too bogged down at this point, and he's trying to sum up too many things that he's created. Yeah, it, yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. It's like... TLDR, go to, go to the gym uh, and take care of your mind. Yeah, the end. Like th that's that that's the end of it with no real uh, practical advice on anything. And it's I think there's actually a very interesting question uh, around this this idea, which he doesn't touch at all. But it's like you, you could have a much more in interesting conversation around this because I feel like this is a thing in the in the modern world, which is the concept of burnout. Like people never taking time, yeah, right, to have breaks. Or to regenerate uh, intellectual capital, like or build themselves back up. That that's like there's there could be something interesting here about constantly working is depleting a resource, and you you have to be aware of rebuilding that resource in times off. But it's like there's no discussion of that. Um, it's just continually additive. Like you you're you're adding. Uh, all of these habits and all of these activities into your life, and then like and now on top of it, like we're going to add all of this community service, like, and you're also going to be reading and you're going to be going to the gym. And it just, at this point, it almost feels like overwhelming the sheer number of things that a person would have to do uh, to maintain all of this. So yeah, it's, there could be a good idea here, but this, this chapter is like, it is at the end and you just, you feel like I can't, I can't go on. Right? Please, please just, please make it end. Please make it end. And that is it. That's the seven habits. 
I maintain, I want to I want to maintain, I, I, I did find use in this book. And I get excited to talk about the bad things because it's funny, right, to talk about the terrible things with you. But I do think there are some interesting things in this book that I am going to take with me. You know, the idea of um, be thinking about being proactive and understanding the language that I use and how it affects things. Thinking about how I want to be remembered. Thinking about trying to maybe create a personal mission statement and what that might look like as a way to sum up how I want my life to, to go before me. Thinking about things that are important and urgent and how I delegate and the emotional bank account. Like These are things that I find genuinely thought-provoking mm -hmm. um, in a way that a lot of these business books don't have the ability to make me think about so many things as this one has done. Mm -hmm. So I, having read this book, I can see why it had been so popular Mm -hmm. Because there are things in here that are interesting 30 years later to me, right? Mm -hmm. This book is thirty, nearly 30 years old. And I think that there is some, some genuinely interesting stuff in this book. But there is also, as with all of these books, a lot of nonsense, just real nonsense. And unfortunately these two ideas are not really these two things are not really mixed together it's like the first half is good and the second half is crazy mm -hmm. which is a shame yeah. Yeah. they didn't mix it up so it kind of lost me yeah again I, I i have to hard not recommend this book to anybody like i i just think for for anybody who is trying to improve their life like it's just it's too much to slog through it's it's too incoherent and while this is the foundation of very many of, of books in this genre, I think you're probably better off picking up, you know, something that is written that is more modern, which may be ripping off the ideas of this book, but, but doing it in a more coherent and constructive manner. So it's like, I just, I cannot recommend this one because the crazy is just, it's too much. And the book is so long. It's such a big ask to have somebody go, go through with it. I just, I can never imagine a situation in which I would recommend to anybody to read this book. Like, again, I haven't read anything further. There are more books in this idea, like created by the Covey company, that could be better, right? Like, they could be more updated. They could be more abbreviated, um, which might be better. But, yeah, I, I agree that, like, I, as I say, there are interesting things here. I recommend trying yeah. to find something that builds upon some of the habits, you know, maybe finding right. out a bit about them. Honestly, you've probably got a lot of what you need from us talking about it for you to decide if you think any of these things are interesting to you and then maybe try and find things that are offshoots of it, maybe just focusing on some of the specific habits because it is really, really long and there is a lot of it that really doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and that with all of these books, it is what makes it hard that they are filling pages. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of it is just genuinely pages need to be filled and they're filling them. And you can feel that. There are times when you can just really feel like he's hitting a word count for this chapter because it's just stuff like, I don't know why you're talking about this anymore. So there is yeah, a lot see, of that in I, here. I don't think he's hitting a word count, right? This to me, again, it just, it just, it just reads as like, a Markov chain generator that people just didn't didn't shut off soon enough, right? And it's like, oh, yeah. we got a thousand no pages, right, of this thing, and ship it, right? Like whatever, it because it doesn't matter because it's like it's uh, it's fractally self similar at a large scale and at a small scale, like it's it's all the same throughout the whole thing. It doesn't matter. Just ship a thousand pages of it. So, uh, yeah, I, there are books where I definitely feel like, oh, I can see how you turned your interesting article into a paperback book that you're now going to sell, I, and there's like then you can feel like, oh, okay, you're obviously just padding here. But but this this I think I think we're getting pure Covey here. I I think there there was no point where he was like, mm, I need to hit that word count. I feel like he he had this book flow through him and it and it came out into the world. Mike, do you want to close out our discussion on the seven habits of highly effective people with the music? that was played in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? I think so, because we had to listen to it a lot. So I think our listeners should have to get it just at least once, just so they can understand the sacrifice that we made for them. Uh, so yes, here is the music, which punctuated almost every 10 minutes, it felt like, of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. 